also present some evidence on on the validation exercises we do uh, to make sure that the measure of effectiveness we have for school principals is okay. And in the last part of the talk, I'm going to be talking about principals labor market and more specifically about the selection dimension of the labor market. So let's get started. I guess uh, most people agree that management is a key resource of both private and public enterprises. However, identifying and recruiting effective managers remains challenging and more so in the public sector because incentive schemes are hard to define, maybe because of, because of a multitasking problem, but in practice, they are mostly absent. And moreover, especially in the developing world, discretionary appointments and patronage can, can be perver perversive. So despite the relevance of management uh, for state capacity, Research on the effectiveness and allocation of managerial talent in the public sector has lagged behind that of politicians or managers in the private sector. And I think there are two reasons for that. The first is that it's pretty hard to get an objective measure of worker quality, in particular managers. And on top of that, it's hard to find quasi-experimental variation in personal selection policies. So to, to think about this, today we are gonna focus on the case of Chile, uh, school principals in Chile, Chile has rich administrative data that allow us to construct an objective measure of principal effectiveness. And on top of that, we have reform in 2011 uh, that basically made the selection process uh, of school principals in public schools more competitive and transparent. I don't know if there was a question. No? Um, so today I'm gonna try to answer two research questions. The first, how important are school principals for student outcomes? And second, how important is personal selection in the public sector? A summary of the findings. In the first part of the study, we develop a novel extension of the well-known teacher value added model. What we find is that principles matter in the sense that one standard deviation increase in principal effectiveness can raise a student's course grades by 0.3 standard deviations. I'm gonna show you some quasi-experimental evidence and also results from teacher surveys that kind of validate or measure of principles value added. Then in the second part of the study, uh, we leverage quasi-experimental variation from a reform that increased uh, the transparency and the competitiveness of the personal selection uh, in public schools. And we show that this reform increased the effectiveness of school principals in public schools by 0.06 standard deviations. That doesn't seem huge, but it's enough to close the achievement gap between public and private schools uh, by half after five years. And we also find suggestive evidence that the new selection of principals improve a uh, college admission scores. And we rationalize so, this result. Sorry, when, when, you talk, when you talk about principal effectiveness, what, what is that exactly? I'm not familiar with this um, teacher value added model. Right, so we are trying to get a measure of what is the principal contribution in the education production function to the achievement of the student. So if you think that the student from one year to another is gaining some achievement, they are learning more, they are improving test scores or they are improving course grades. Uh, mm -hmm. We wanna see which, uh, what, which amount, amount of that improvement is due to principal, which amount is due to teachers, which amount might be related to the school. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna try to disentangle that education production function, let's say, using a value added model. Great, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, uh, Pablo. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are some similar results for private schools or not? Not this is a standard. Have... Right, not that I am aware of. Uh, okay. Not that I'm aware of. So I'm basically exploiting like a civil service reform that changed the way in which the school principals in public schools um, are elected. One advantage of the public setting is that I have access to the appointments, so I, I can tell when a school is changing the principal using this new selection method. I haven't seen something like that for, for private schools. Oh, Pablo, just, just, sorry, I just understand. I mean, you're, you're not really, I mean, you're, you're like finding the production fun function for, for, uh, uh, for students grades, but you're not quite telling us what the principal is actually doing, right? I mean, right. you're not telling us whether he or she is providing different incentives or different promotions, uh, schemes, that, right. that's, that's not clear, right? 
So today I'm going to be silent about that. We have explored that in the previous version of the paper. We check whether the principal was doing tracking of students, let's say sorting students across classroom. We look at teacher rotation, which seems to decrease uh, under more effective principals. And I'm going to explain, explain later on why we removed that from the paper, but, but we have thought about it and and it seems to decrease teacher turnover. They don't do much in terms of tracking. And we also have some data from the Superintendencia de Educación. And we can see complaints. So complaints of the parents about the facilities. Uh, so there is also some, some, something there. Uh, but we removed that from this version of the paper uh, because it was a bit too much. Uh, and I feel after presenting the work again that I should add this uh, back again, just to help people to understand what principals are doing. But for now, it's just how much they help the students to increase a uh, course grades and test scores. So, uh, Pablo, it's it's fair to say that basically you are going to identify a manager speaks effect, and and one interpretation is managerial skills, but you can come up with other stuff that we can think that they are playing the same role, right? It, it's, it does right. That, okay, that's okay. super fair to say, and I think one exercise that is kind of obvious is to just correlate the fixed effect against a principal characteristics, uh, maybe surveys about what they do within the schools, uh, but all that would be purely correlational. Uh, we certainly do it to look at the correlation between principal effectiveness and principal characteristics, but we don't have anything as cool as uh, these management surveys that Bloom et al. Uh, might have. Uh, but I think that's, that's fair to say. These are like manager fixed effects. Um, well, we talk about this a little bit, but the paper is related with the value added literature. It's also related to the management literature, but more deeply, I feel it's related with the personal economics of the state. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to discuss any of these papers. But I'm happy to do it afterwards. Let me quickly go uh, over the institutional setting. I guess most people is aware of all this. So in the 80s, there were two big reforms in the context of a dictatorship. In the 81, Chile implemented a nationwide system of school vouchers, and we have a mixed schooling system today. 50% uh, of the schools are public, 40% are subsidized private schools, and we have this 7% of more elite type of private schools that do not receive vouchers. And evidence on the effect of vouchers is, I would say, a mix. The other important reform happened in 1986, and basically this reform moved the administration of public schools from the central government to local government or municipalities in a process known as municipalization. Uh, and we know municipalities are different, not only in terms of uh, the finance of the municipality, but also in terms of uh, political cycles, uh, probity, and, and so on. The educational system has two cycles, primary and secondary. We have around 9,000 schools in the country. On average, each school has 300 students. That's masking a lot of heterogeneity, um, as we are gonna see in a couple of slides. In terms of a student achievement, and, and this is more important, teachers uh, are the ones who determine the final grade, the course grade of the student, based roughly on, on four or more exams. Every year, uh, you have a standardized exams, the SIMSE, but it's not taken every year. So we don't see the SIMSE for two consecutive years for a given student. So that's gonna prevent us from using a value added model based on test scores, because we are not sure if we should attribute the growth in test score to the teacher the student had in grade uh, five or six or seven. Okay, so we're gonna, we are gonna be working with, with course grades instead of test scores because of this uh, limitation. However, in Chile, we have a standardized national curriculum and that creates, a, in fact, a strong correlation between test scores and course grades. If you look at the correlation, oops. If you look at the correlation between SIMSE test scores and course grades within a classroom, that's 0.6. If you look at the correlation between standardized course grades and the college admission score, so the weight of the score the student uses to apply, and the correlation is 0.8. That's of course larger because the college admission score not only take into account the entrance exams of math and Spanish, but also uh, the course grades uh, themselves. Sorry, Pablo. You could also use a sensor panel in order to test whether your results are robust when using SIMSE seems seems test, right? I mean, did, did you try that or not? We, we, have, we have done a robustness checks focusing only on SIMSE. 
and we can do that to, to check that the measure of principal effectiveness is kind of okay. In the previous version of the paper, uh, we found that all the results hold using test scores. Uh, issue with, with that um, approach though, is that we cannot really get at the teacher value added. Uh, and most people would like to see the effect of principal disentangled from the effect of the teacher. And looking at course grades allow us to do that. Um, but the previous version of the paper uh, was using test scores for the principals and everything uh, looks roughly the same. It, it gets a bit noisier because you have fewer years with test scores, mm -hmm. but, but everything looks roughly the same. Uh, we're gonna be using uh, data from different sources. We have a student panel, so we can see the student age and gender. We know the classroom where the student sits and the teacher uh, that the student has in math and Spanish. And we can look at the student performance in, in the form of course grades and test scores. We have a panel of schools, including a school enrollment, the ownership of the school, the chair of disadvantaged students. We have a panel of workers uh, with age, gender, the occupation of the worker within the school, the type of contract and the hours of contract. For a few years, we also have data on workers' wages. So we can see teachers and principal wages from 2015 to 2017. That, of course, exclude fully private schools because they don't have to report back any information to the government, but we have that wage data for the public sector and the subsidized private schools. And we are gonna complement this data with teacher surveys um, with some records from the civil service that tell us the timing in which a new principal is appointed uh, under the new selection system. And finally, some data on the uh, student college, college admission scores. To give you a feeling of the data, uh, in panel A, you have the student characteristics. You can see that when you look at private compared to public schools, students at private schools tend to do a slightly better, both in terms of course grades and test scores, and they also have a lower level of grade retention. Regarding a school characteristics, private schools are on average larger. That might have to do with the fact that they don't go to rural places as much as uh, public schools. Uh, they also have fewer uh, disadvantaged students. These are students receiving the target uh, subsidy, the SEP. And uh, as a consequence of that, they have a, a smaller amount of the annual subsidy per student. In terms of school attendance, there is not much going on, but public schools have lower uh, attendance. Now, something that is gonna be more relevant to the paper are the characteristics of the principal. You can see that on average, private schools pay higher wages. And when you look at the wage components, you can see that the bonus payments are twice as large in private than in public schools. The statutory payments are twice as large, as large in public schools than in private schools. And those statutory payments are related to experience, certification, uh, staff, that the law defines. Uh, most principals in public schools are female and they seem to have more job security if you proxy job security with the type of contract. Okay, um, I think I'm doing well with the time. I'm gonna slow down a bit. We are gonna be estimating a value added model. Value added models typically have this first line. So forget about this second line. So a typical value added model has some measure of a student achievement in the left hand side. And they are called a value added model because you control by the lag achievement of the student. So if this function was a linear function on the lag achievement and beta was one, this would be a model of gains, like a model in first differences. So the lag of the student achievement is, try is trying to take into account the effect of the student. We are gonna follow the literature and we are gonna include a third degree polynomia of the student of the lag of the student course grade and the average classroom course grade interacted with grade level dummies. We are gonna have grade level uh, fixed effects and year fixed effects. And we are gonna control by a student age and principal's tenure. From these models, just focusing on the first line, what people typically do is to recover the residual at the classroom level. And that's what they call the teacher value added. So whatever is not explained by the student, uh, year dummies, grade level dummies, whatever is in the residual at the classroom level is what they call the teacher value added. They do some shrinkage to minimize prediction error 
and that's like the standard uh, teacher value added. Now we are extending that model by including principal fixed effects. So we are going to estimate a two-way fixed effect model, uh, IAKM type of model, and to disentangle the effect of the principal from the effect of the school or other school related factors, we are gonna control by a bunch of school characteristics in a correlated random effects fashion. And I'm gonna be discussing <clears throat> these two way fixed effects and the correlated random effects in the next slides. But before moving on, I just wanna point out something that you might have noticed. We are looking at the achievement of the student in T plus one, non, not at time T. The reason why we are doing that is that if you have the achievement, the course grade at time T, you might confound teachers who are easy graders as high value added teachers, right? So what we are gonna do following Peter and Pope is to focus on students who change teacher uh, from one year to another. And then we are gonna say that a teacher at time T is a good teacher in math. If the achievement of the student in T plus one with a different math teacher improves relative to a baseline. So that basically allows us to remove a bit the concern regarding bias in teacher fixed effects due to easy graders looking like high value added teachers, which in turn would bias <laughs> our principal effectiveness. Um, so that's what we do. Now- Question, question. Yes. Um, how do you deal or do you think it's a problem that, the, that the why uh, measure grades are somehow bounded? Therefore, you know, if the student already has a six, they only can improve a little bit. And basically, um, you know, a teacher in a, with good students only can do worse. And basically uh, then most teacher fixed effects are gonna be only be focused capturing those guys with low grades that they have some room to improve. So um, whenever it's on a score or something that, or, you know, any other growth, let's say, for example, sales in an industry, suppose uh, this applies to firm, you know, sales are unbounded and you can always sell more if you are a good manager. But here grades are, are the idea that are bounded makes uh, this uh, asymmetric treatment for those that are already good students and there is no room to improve in comparison with uh, other, uh, other guys that, that are only, uh, yeah. I understand and, Any and, and, I think, and I think you are right. What we are capturing is like an average effect uh, at that school. I think, however, that the same is true about test scores. If you have a school that is always at the top of the SIMS uh, uh, test score distribution, there is no way uh, to improve uh, there either. So that's a fair point. What people can do, and I have seen something similar to this, is to kind of estimate this model in a sample of low performing students, and then in a sample of high per performing students. And then you have some sort of um, two dimensional value added measure. Because what you are saying is right. Uh, and, and in this paper, we are not taking that into account directly. We just estimate this for the whole population. I think especially in schools, well, there is this uh, Ken Che paper uh, talking about mean reversion, um, basically saying that Sometimes randomly, some schools do great, they receive a prize, and, and those that are doing poorly for some random reason, they next year they do great, and you know, and, and, and people confuse that, that sort of uh, achievement due to the prize they receive. But, uh, so I think that, that mean probation might apply here, and I think they, they have a statistical way to deal with that. Actually, they do so with Urquiola, and it's with Chilean data. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna check that to see if we can do something along those lines uh, to account for this mean reversion type of uh, issue. Uh, however, I think <clears throat> that if there was any mean reversion, <laughs> we would see that the estimate will go to zero on average because we estimate this across uh, different time periods from 2011 to 2016. Uh, but, but, I, but I see your point and, and we should maybe do more about that. Yeah, I, I think Carlo is is completely right, but but censoring is is going against significance, isn't it? Uh, I mean, it, it it might be that that would make good principals look bad just because they are already at the top 
of uh, what they can do. Uh, so I, I think it's a fair concern. Uh, however, I'm trying to control for as much as I can. So I'm trying to account for many school characteristics that might correlate with being, a, with, with having a school with high achievers, let's call it uh, like that. Um, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a concern that is there and, and I think it's not only in this case, that's a concerning value-added models in general, I guess. The optimal type of exam you would like to have is an exam that has, I don't know, 100 students, sorry, 100 questions, and then you answer that exam in first grade and you get three right, and then you answer that in second grade and you get four or five right, and then in sixth grade. And that would be like an absolute measure of knowledge, let's say, uh, but I haven't seen something, something like that. But I do think it's a fair point. Now, um, we're gonna estimate this uh, in a two-way, as a two-way fixed effect model. Um, these models are simple and tractable. They have become more popular. However, the fixed effects are identified by movers, in this case, teachers who move across principles, so they can only be compared within the largest, within connected sets. And in practice, we are gonna take the largest connected set uh, to compare uh, these fixed effects. We have around 26,000 movers. And the final estimation sample is gonna include a 7 million observations that those observations are at the student subject level. And we have something like 2,000, something like 2 million students, 64,000 teachers and 8,000 school principals. Now, a challenge in this, set, in this setting on top of separating the effect of teachers from the effect of principal is to separate, is to separate the effect of principals from other school related factors. So we are gonna be using correlated random effects to account for that. These are more commonly used in nonlinear settings such as quantile regressions, um, but they are also being used these days in linear models to absorb a cross-group variation in unobservables. So the idea is similar to the idea of a control function approach. We are gonna be using variation across observable characteristics of schools to proxy for variation in unobservable characteristics across the schools. So for instance, if having, a, I don't know, a good gym or a swimming pool uh, helps students to improve their learning, and we don't account by that in the model as an econometrician, then you might be biased, and then your, your estimate of principal effectiveness might be biased by the fact that uh, the measure is not really reflecting principal effectiveness, but instead the access of uh, the principal in the school to a swimming pool or a good gym. So the idea of this uh, approach uh, and it's, it relies on some selection of observables, is that by controlling by the income of the parents of that school, you are implicitly accounting uh, for the likelihood of the school to have a nice gym or a nice swimming pool. So that's what we are doing. Altonji and Mansfield show that this works kind of okay, and it's the best we can do in order to disentangle these three components, teachers, uh, principals, and schools. And we include as many... Yes. Yeah, so essentially, is it fair to say that this is to avoid school fixed effects? Exactly that, because we don't have enough switchers. Like principals don't move as often as teachers do, for instance. Um, so if right, have... an, an ideal setting will be you use a school fixed effect and you avoid explaining right. why you are doing this fancy stuff. Exactly, exactly. So I can do that, but then I would have only a few switchers. So and that, that would be one issue. And also, it's not so straightforward how to go with a three-way fixed effect. Uh, but you are totally right. That's why we, I mean, that's why we are doing it. You, you could do this for this subsample, right? So the subsample of switchers and see if they are consistent, the results, etc. I could. And we do some robustness checks, checks using those event studies. So I'm going to show you something along those lines in, in a couple of slides. So we're going to see what happens when a new principal comes to a school, what happened with the students in that school. But we are controlling for as many school characteristics as we can. We have total enrollment, we have the fraction of disadvantaged students, we have the chair of low and high income parents, and the chair of parents with a college degree. And importantly, for the correlated random effects, if we have the across time average of those time variant characteristics, plus indicators on whether the school is in a rural place, whether it's public or private, and the characteristics of the municipality where the school is, is located. Now, even question. Um, no? Yes. Um, okay. No, I was I was thinking because okay, so um, 
you, you are the, um, you know, looking at the data as the teachers switch between um, different schools. Okay, we are trying to correct for um, fixed school effects, but Chile is probably like in the, in, in OECD at least, like in a huge class of countries, is the country which has the most um, differentiation, most difference between its school system. Because as you said, it has been municipalized. It is uh, financed by the municipality, which is very exceptional. It doesn't happen uh, as far as I, I know in any other OECD country. In all the other OECD countries, it is centralized that there's a central ministry and the ministry manages the schools. And of course, if it is uh, centrally managed uh, and financed, then the difference between the schools will be less. It will not be perfectly homogeneous, but the difference between the schools will be much less compared to Chile. So then, like, why would you do this analysis for Chile where you would have the most problems with school fixed effects and not use uh, some other country where um, the schools are centrally managed? Okay, so that's a fair point. If I understood correctly, you are saying that the across school variation in Chile is way larger than the cross school variation in, in, in other OECD countries, for instance. Um, yes. The reason, okay, the reason why I'm doing it in Chile is that you have this data, like I have access to this kind of data and we have a civil service reform that allows me to answer the question I really care about, which is the impact of personal selection on workers' quality, in this case, uh, managers. Now, take into account, however, that the model is absorbing a lot of variation. So if there is sorting of students into schools, let's say, we are accounting by the lag achievement of the student. So we are already controlling by a lot of that variation across schools. Let's say the pool of students they get is different. On top of the controls we are including at the school level. But I see your point and we have some validation exercises uh, looking at principal switches uh, within a school. And we find that the fixed effects we estimate have a high predictive power of what's gonna happen in the school after a high or a low value added teachers sorry, high or low value added principal enter that school. So give me a couple of slides to see if I can go back at that. Uh, but, but I think it's a fair point that maybe in the case of Chile, this across school variation is uh, accentuated. You have way more than in other countries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but where was I? Okay. So let's get at the validity exercises now. So. The use of the value-added models as a personal tool is controversial because you might wonder, and I think we have been discussing about this, uh, whether they do deliver a causal, whether they deliver a causal estimate or not. And there is this uh, traditional at this point debate between Jesse Rostin and Raj Cherry um, on this. Now, in our setting, we are a bit less concerned that in the teacher value-added setting, because we have many more observations per principals than they have per, per teacher. However, the identification still relies on a strict exogeneity or selection on an on observable assumption, which is ultimately untestable. That's the fundamental problem of causal inference. However, we can use uh, the data we have to perform some validity checks in the spirit of Rostein and, and Chetty. So the first one is a falsification test. Uh, this is proposed by, by Rostein for the case of teachers. And we are changing this a bit for the case of principals. The idea is to focus on a subset of students who are forced to change schools between primary and secondary. So they are going to a school that only offers primary and then after eighth grade, they have to move. This is like a structural change as some authors uh, call it. So these students are forced to change principles. So what Jesse Rosten is saying is that if there is no sorting of students into principles, then you shouldn't expect the effectiveness of the principal tomorrow to have an impact on the achievement of the student today. So we're gonna check that. We are gonna have the principal effectiveness at the school of origin for the schools, the principal effectiveness at the school of destination. And what we find is that effectiveness of the principal at the school of origin, of course, correlates with the achievement, with the gains and achievement of the student in the school of origin. However, the effectiveness of the principal the students are gonna to have tomorrow does not correlate with the achievement of the student today 
at least we don't find any statistically significant uh, association there. So that's reassuring, I think. The second exercise following a uh, cherry is to look at quasi experiments. So these quasi experiments are basically principles switching uh, in a given school. So the idea is to check what is the predictive power of the principal fixed effects. So how well do they predict the change that is gonna happen uh, with the student uh, course grades after their arrival or their exit. So to try to be more clear, let's focus on, on panel A. So this is event study. We have almost 600 of these events. This is event study around the time of arrival of a low value added principal. So it's the arrival of a principal at the bottom of the principal fixed effect distribution. And here you have the average uh, standardized uh, course grade in that school before and after the arrival of this low value added principal. And what you see is that after the arrival, there is, as you would predict, a decrease in course grades because you got a low value added uh, principal. And what I think is more important is that you cannot reject that the change in course grades in the raw data uh, is the same as the change in principal effectiveness. So this is what Chetty takes to say that there is a predictive, a predictive power in these uh, value added measures. The last exercise to validate uh, our measure of principal effectiveness uses uh, teacher surveys. So teachers are asked about uh, principal attributes or qualities. So in the left-hand side, and this is just a correlation, we have the uh, chair of teachers working for principal P that highly agree with a positive statement about the principal. And we wanna see how that likelihood of agreeing relates, correlates with the principal effectiveness. And we find that more effective principals, I mean, teachers working for more effective principals are more likely to agree with positive statements about uh, the principal, such as she engages teachers, she knows the teacher needs, engages parents, and so on. And in the paper, we have some robustness checks, some placebo exercises. We also check for multiple hypothesis testing uh, following Romano Wolf. Uh, everything uh, is robust to those checks. Okay, so having said that, uh, I'm getting now into the last part of the talk. Um, which, Pablo? Sorry. Yeah, mm -hmm. but so the interpretation will be like uh, a good a good manager makes teachers happier and happier teachers uh, put better grades. That that's, I mean, how can you how do you link? Good environment with good grades. I think that that are they doing something different at the classroom? Happier teachers put better grades. That that that, that link. Uh, if you can discuss any thoughts on that, will be nice. Right. So I think there is something that um, you might consider a misspecification, but it's typical in these models, which is that you don't have really like match effects. So I have a, a fixed effect for the principal, one for the teacher. I don't really have match effects here. So all those type of stories, I guess, might be going to the residual and might implicitly be generating some bias. Uh, so that's a fair point. And I think that's also one of the typical critiques on the AKM models where you have workers and, and firms because you don't take match effects in, in, into account. So that's fair. And I guess all those things might, might be going on and I cannot really get at that eh, with this model. Um, so that's a fair point. Uh, Pablo, related with that, is there any change in the wages of the teachers or something like that? You have that data, isn't it? I have that data, but since I only have it for a, a, a small number of years, like three years, uh, I didn't check eh, what's going on there with different principles. In practice, though, I mean, not in practice, like <laughs> the jury, principals cannot do much regarding teacher wages in the public schools. They only have a saying regarding the firing of teachers. They can fire up to the 5% of teachers with the lowest evaluations, but they cannot really affect wages in the Chilean context in public schools. Okay, so you can't give a budget to the, to the new 
to a new principle. That's. I mean, in the I mean, in the previous version of the paper, we had like a lot of data about the like the public finance of the school, and people were saying, and I think they were right. It was not fair to to blame the principal for the management of the budget because they don't really have much of a say in the public sector. Uh, so this this has to do with the question at the beginning about what principals do, and I think what they can do is to create a good uh, working environment, like a nice climate within the school that might help to retain high value added teachers. I think that might be one mechanisms me mechanism behind this. We haven't checked that yet because there is uh, an econometric issue regarding the covariance between teacher and principal fixed effects. That's gonna bias uh, our estimate of how good are principals to keep high value added teachers. So that's something that uh, I can tell you is work in progress, but we haven't done that. Something else that the principals could do is tracking, as I said, and we don't find much evidence of, of that. Uh, but I'm not sure if they can really decide on the budget. That's what I'm trying to say by themselves. No, no, but, but I'm saying that perhaps you want to foster some, you know, in, in, in some places you want to hire new principals with new budgets and that sort of stuff. Right, I think all those policies that give more school autonomy, for instance, might be a nice complement to this policy. And there is evidence that the school autonomy uh, can improve outcomes, for instance, in England. Um, but I think in the in the setting I'm studying, uh, there is not much room for that. Um, so public sector compensation. So sorry, let me do the transition. So now I'm going to get into the uh, principal's labor market. I'm going to go quickly over uh, the wages in the public sector and the public schools, and then I'm going to think about the recruitment of principals. So public sector is characterized by fixed wage schemes. Um, public schools are not the exception. There is this ongoing debate about whether not having pay for performance is making it difficult to attract and retain uh, the better teachers and principals in the schools. And I think this uh, discussion also applies to the case of Chile because public schools as well have heavily have wages heavily based on seniority certification, all these like fixed components, uh, while private schools have more room for uh, within a school bargaining. And, and as a consequence of that, they have less statutory payments and more room for pay for performance. If you just look at wages, they are more compressed in the public sector. There is more variance in uh, the wages of private schools. And as I told you at the beginning, in terms of, of wage components, private schools have more pay for performance and less statutory payments. And I really don't have time because I only had one hour, but in the paper, we have some means of regressions to try to correlate wages with uh, principal attributes, such as the effectiveness. We find a correlation between principal effectiveness and wages only in private schools, uh, and it's a small. It's one standard deviation increase in principal effectiveness is correlated with a 2% increase in uh, principal, sorry, in wages. So I'm gonna skip that for now, but the main point I guess is public schools have fixed wages, and they have less room for pay for performance. So with that in mind, uh, one wonders whether public schools can attract high quality candidates if those candidates demand higher wages, right? So if you think about race selection, for instance, high quality candidates demand higher wages and those are offered by the private schools, so they will go there. However, the point we try to make with a very simple model is that higher wages may not suffice or not be the only relevant variable because worker choice also depends on the idiosyncratic preferences they have. Workers might have preferences for the public sector, for social behavior or uh, risk aversion, uh, and they might prefer like a, a public sector job that is more safe. And also worker choice is constrained um, by the selection process. So workers are constrained by the demand that they face. So a simple way to put this, is to think of a principal that has an indirect utility from working at a school type S, which for simplicity might be public or private. So the utility, the indirect utility of this principal uh, has a linear component that might be the baseline wage, that might be amenity, anything that enters linearly. But it has this uh, pay for performance component. So the principal quality is paid differently in public and private schools, and that's given by this omega S component. 
and principles may have idiosyncratic preferences for the school type S. And you know, in these choice models, you can get at the probability of applying uh, to a given school, and we are going to call that QIS. Now, schools, and this is, I guess, uh, <laughs> the interesting part of the model, can choose from the pool of applicants based on some rule. So for instance, you might think of a linear rule, and this is something that Abo and Farber were thinking, were thinking when, when they were trying to study unions. So they were saying, okay, if union jobs are so amazing, then I guess the union can choose who worker is gonna join the union. So they might select the best workers in terms of uh, productivity. So you might think that the schools also have some selection rule. For instance, a linear rule in which uh, they are more likely to select higher quality uh, candidates. Now, of course, this is a Mickey Mouse uh, version of the model. Uh, I'm just trying to make a point here. And uh, in the appendix, we have like a proper model with the timing of the game and so on. But the idea is that you have Roy type of selection on one hand. So you will have that from the point of view of the worker, higher effectiveness principles are gonna be less likely to go to public schools because they pay less for performance. Now, the school might choose only the best candidates. So a worker is less likely to be in the public school if their effectiveness is low. So what the selection dimension uh, brings uh, is basically that you can break the Roy selection and get some sort of concave function uh, for the allocation of talent in the public sector. Now, you would get different uh, results under different selection rules. So if the public schools are just flipping a coin to decide who the candidate will, uh, who, which candidate will get the job, then you are gonna have pure Roy selection and high quality candidates won't go to public schools uh, on average. If you have a threshold, threshold crossing rule, so you are only gonna choose candidate with a quality above a given threshold, then you would get some uh, allocation like this one. Now, a nice thing of the model is that you can back up the average quality in a given school type. So we can get uh, an expression for the average quality in public schools. Uh, we can compute that using Bayes rule. We can get this uh, conditional density. And then we can do a simple simulation that is just to make one point. The point being that you can improve quality in public schools by increasing pay for performance. So the omega parameter in the worker sign direct utility a function. So if you increase pay for performance, you get uh, better workers to apply for those jobs uh, and you improve quality in the, of the workers in the public sector. But even if you don't have any pay for performance or you really cannot do much about that, you can still improve the quality of the public sector workers by being careful enough about the selection uh, of these workers. So if you select the best from the pool of applicant, that's definitely better than just choosing at random or just appointing your friend. Uh, and that's the point we are trying to make with, with the model. And even though this selection dimension of the labor market is of high practical relevance, there is not much, much research on that. And as I said, this had, has to do with the fact that it's very complicated to get an, an objective measure of workers' quality. And on top of that, it's very weird to find a variation in, in personal selection policies. So we are gonna be studying the effects of a reform that changed the way in which the school principal is appointed in public school. This is the reform from 2011 on equity and quality in education. So before the reform, municipalities were in charge of the appointment of new school principals, and that was a bit of a black box. After the reform, every time a school wants to uh, fill the position for the school, for, for, for principal, they have to post vacancies uh, in a public web page, everyone can access and can apply. The civil service, which is, as, as you know, the uh, an agency of the central government in charge of selecting the top level bureaucrats. The civil service is the institution that approves the admissibility of the applicants. And then they hire an external human resources agency, which leads the process of selection to create a short list that at most will have three candidates. Now, from those the candidates, it is still the mayor who makes the final call about who the principal would be. But I think in principle, this should have decreased the discretion of the mayor uh, in that call, in making that call. So to estimate the impact of um, this reform, 
we're going to use a different diff approach. The dependent variable is going to be the effectiveness of the principal in school S at time T. We're going to have school and year fixed effects. This principal turnover dummy is a dummy that equals one after the school appoints a principal. It's the first appointment after 2012 in private and public schools. So it's just an indicator of turnover and it is one from the first time a new principal is appointed uh, until the, the end of the time period. And ADP is a dummy that's gonna equal to one after the first time a principal is appointed using this new selection system. And it stays like one uh, afterwards. The parameter of interest then is- What year is the reform? It's 2011 uh, and the, it's 2011 and the first school we see uh, adopting this, um, and we see the first school adopting this new selection uh, system in 2012. So the first principal appointed under uh, the civil service selection uh, uh, is appointed in 2012. So the, the, the same mayors you said, because they changed mayors in 2013. Uh, so since I have variation in the timing of adoption, different schools adopted at different times because they had to uh, fill the position at different moments in time, or, and also because some contests were like uh, empty, nobody applied, for instance, to some rural schools. I have variation in the timing of adoption. So the law is from 2011, uh, but the adoption uh, is kind of a smooth, it's kind of uniform across time, actually, from 2012 to 2017. And I think there is something interesting to do here <laughs> along yes, the lines of what you are thinking. Yes, you want to change. You want to control for that for the change in the. Right. Okay. I guess it's not the same if if you are keeping the same incumbent or or if there is a change in, in the political yes, authority. There some changes there. Yes. Yeah. No. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. We should do something with that. Uh, we also have some uh, predetermined school and municipality level controls interacted with year dummies just to give some flexibility to the specification, but uh, this doesn't change the results at all. And we're gonna estimate the dynamic version of the model just to check for pretrends. Uh, so let's focus on column one. Remember that, that the dependent variable is the principal effectiveness at a given school. What column one tell us is that after the new selection system is in place after a principal is appointed under the new selection system, the principal effectiveness in that school increases by 0.06 standard deviations. Now that effect is robust to adding school controls, municipality controls, or both. We also have a robustness check in which we basically remove schools that are too likely or too unlikely to adopt the new selection system, the results are still the same. So that's from whole column one to five. There we have both public and private schools. So private schools are in a way controls for the public schools. So the turnover at private schools is a control for the turnover at public schools. Now in column six, we focus exclusively on public schools. So in this case, identification comes from the timing of adoption of the policy. So we're gonna compare the schools that are treated who adopted uh, and appointed a principal under the new selection to not yet treated schools or never treated schools, public schools. And again, we find a positive effect of the new selection system. It increases principal effectiveness by 0.05 standard deviations. And we check the robustness of that uh, point estimate to the recent developments in the stagger diff and diff literature, with Jason Martin and Callaway Santana. And we find that uh, the effect is robust, or at least the estimate we find is in between uh, the estimates you get with these new techniques. In column nine, we do a placebo check. So the idea here is to focus on public schools, but before the reform, so before 2012. And what we find is that turnover by itself in public schools do not increase the principal effectiveness. And in column 10, uh, the last placebo exercise focuses on private schools and in the post-reform period. So what we have is that if anything, principal turnover in private schools is associated with a decrease in principal quality in the post-reform period. Uh, 
the event study look uh, okay, I think. And there is no much evidence of mean reversion. The point estimate is pretty stable through time. Um, so that's, I think, good for us. And I have uh, three minutes. So let me skip that. I think uh, course are grades. You? Yes? Are you, have, you have five more minutes if you want. OK. We started a little bit late. No worries. OK, <laughs> thank you. So I think a natural benchmark to assess the impact of this new selection uh, system on the equity of the public private gap uh, would be the, sorry, one way to assess the impact of ADP on the equity is to focus on the public private uh, course grade gap because we're focusing on course grades. So that gap is 0.17 standard deviations. Uh, that's the gap between public and private schools. Now, I told you in the first part of the talk that one standard deviation in increase in principal effectiveness is associated with 0.3 standard deviations increase in student course grades. Now, I recently showed you that ADP adoption, the adoption of the new selection system, increases effectiveness by 0.06 standard deviations. So a simple back of the envelope calculation would suggest that Ceteris Paribus, the reform would be enough to close the public private gap in course grades by half after five years. So we may take that as <laughs> something in favor of the impact of the reform on equity. Now, we cannot really tell much about long run effects, but since course grades are such an important component of the composite score uses for use for college admissions and eligibility for financial aid, we think that maybe uh, if the ADP had an impact on college admission scores, it's likely that it will have an impact on long-term outcomes as long as college uh, has positive returns, both pecuniary and non-pecuniary. So what we are gonna do in the final part uh, of the paper is to study the impact of the appointment. So the same type of specification as before, but now on the college entrance exams and the weighted application score for each student. So to do so, we are gonna be using a different uh, data set with data on the centralized admission system between 2010 and 2017. And we are gonna focus on the weighted score that the student gets at, it, at, its, at its most preferred application. So, you know, students apply to different uh, college major uh, options. So we're gonna take the first, uh, the option that is ranked first, we're gonna compute the weighted score they get at that option. And we are gonna use the average of that at the school level to look at the impact of the policy on college admission score. And we find that there is a positive effect of the adoption of this new selection uh, system on the entrance exams of math and Spanish. We are looking at math and Spanish because those are the exams that everyone has to take. And there is an even larger effect on the application score, which makes sense given that the application score is taking into account course grade grades directly and also through the ranking. So just to conclude, uh, I think we have shown that principles matter in the sense that one standard deviation increase in principal effectiveness does increase course grades by 0.3 standard deviations. So that's a large effect. And we also find that personal selection can improve the allocation of talent in the public sector. This reform in particular increases the average effectiveness by 0.06 standard deviations. We think that improving the selection is definitely a cost-effective way to boost school quality. For one thing, the school principals have an impact on all the students. That's not the case uh, with teachers. Also, better principal selection can improve accountability in the public sector. That's very important in settings where you have interest groups and um, having a saying about the appointment of personnel. And finally, uh, we believe that other policies that have been studied in the literature, such as providing uh, training to the managers or increasing the autonomy of the schools, might be nice complements uh, to the better selection, uh, better personal selection policies. So, thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, really nice presentation. So, anyone, anyone else has additional questions?
Okay, in honor of time, we will stop here. Um, thank you, Paulo, and hope we will continue yeah. with the one-to-one -one meetings in the same in the same link. Thanks, everyone, so, for the feedback and, and for listening. Thanks. Okay.